Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie, and welcome to part two of our Glad You Asked conversation with Pastor Gabe Hughes, answering all your questions about The Chosen. This two-part episode is a follow-up to our 2021 series of episodes reviewing seasons one and two of The Chosen. If you haven't listened to the 2021 series or part one of this Glad You Asked episode, don't worry, we've got them linked up in the show notes for you, and we'd encourage you to go back and listen to all of them in chronological order. And now, back to our discussion with Pastor Gabe Hughes. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. It sure is a pleasure. Well, considering all of the, you know, the Mormon influence on this, the fact that, uh, you know, they're changing so many things from Scripture, we're, we've got second commandment violation concerns, third commandment violation concerns, all of this. We've Some of our listeners have mentioned to us that they have heard of or their own pastor is bringing the chosen into the church and doing a Bible study off of it or, or things like that. And so we've got some of our listeners who are wondering if if a leader in the church can watch the chosen or bring it into the church for this type of study and still be biblically qualified to lead. What do you think about that? I think if your pastor or anybody in your church is using this as a teaching tool, they need to be confronted. And, and I would say going to them and politely saying that, that when it comes to teaching what the scripture says, we need to go to what the scripture says this is not helping us. This is leading us away from the scripture. And again, by Dallas's own admission, 95% of what's in the show is not in the Bible. Um, I think that he's taking more from scripture than he than he admits in that. You know, he'll he'll say 95% because he just kind of shrugs it off as don't judge me based on what's in the Bible anyway, because I'm not trying to tell the Bible story. He's still pulling Scripture, uh, what what is happening in Scripture, he's still basing all of what he's doing around that. It's kind of like a fan fiction is what it is. And so for the for that reason, this should not be uh, being used in church because it's an endorsement of it. It's as if to say this is actually a legitimate Bible teaching tool. And, and it's not. It's a far cry from what we have in Scripture. You know, just taking the video that I did on John 3.16 alone. And I did. Um, I, I have said this in other interviews that the scene between Jesus and Nicodemus in episode or, or in season one, episode six, I, I think it is six or seven. The scene between the two of them is indicative of every other problem in the chosen, because even their dialogue, even the exchange that they have with one another, that you can see is right there in John three. They've taken the lines and moved them around. It doesn't even happen in the same order. And so when you finally get to John 3, 16, with Jesus saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. When you get to that line, it has an altogether different context than the context that John 3, 16 has in the Bible because they've moved those lines around. They've And Dallas thinks, as long as I get the words in there, then I'm telling the story the right way. That's not how you do Bible exposition. There's a reason why John wrote it the way that he wrote it. There's a direction he's going with it. And you need to look at the words and you need to be discerning as to why the Holy Spirit guided John to write it exactly the way that he did. And then even beyond that, even after you get through, it's like John 3, 16 through half of 17 or something. Uh, Dallas Jenkins doesn't even quote the whole section that's generally attributed to Jesus. But um, even after that, the dialogue that Jesus and Nicodemus have with one another, now we're going into extra biblical. Now we're just going to you know, use our imaginations and think, what else could Jesus and Nicodemus have talked about after this initial conversation? And you have Nicodemus bowing down to Jesus and Jesus telling him to stop doing that in The Chosen. Like, like, what are you doing? You don't have to do that. Yes, everyone has to do that. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And uh, and the Nicodemus character even quotes Psalm 2, to kiss the son lest he become angry with you and perish in the way. That's about Christ. And Jesus almost kind of dismisses that in The Chosen as if to say, that's not the part of Psalm 2 that you should be focusing on. It's actually this part, you know, and Anyway, so 
uh, as I said, there is something, there is teaching that's going on here. Even if, even if we think we're using our imaginations to uh, envision what else Jesus and his disciples may have been doing, there's still Bible teaching happening. And it's, it's contrary to what the Bible says. So again, not a good tool to be using in church. And if you've got a teacher or a pastor that's doing that, I would say make a loving confrontation um, and use tools like this, whether it's this interview or the short video that I've done or any you know articles that you may find of somebody doing a critique of listen to the words, listen to what is actually being said and compare it with what scripture says. And is this actually um, revering the scripture or is it changing the scripture? Are we wise in the way that we're using this uh, and applying it in church? So those things do def- definitely need to be confronted. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, test everything, hold fast to that which is good, and abhor every kind of evil. Yes, indeed. And uh, talking about um, playing fast and loose with the scriptures, with God's breathed out word, uh, we've got listeners asking about the Mary Magdalene character in The Chosen and uh, talking about how, you know, talk about girl power. I mean, they talk about how, um, you know, Mary is practically a disciple here uh, where she's, you know, number 13 and she's wiser than the rest. What do you make of this? This is so bizarre to me. She's not even number 13 in the show. She is number one. She yeah, that's is true. <laughs> the first disciple. Uh, and there is even an episode in season one where Jesus says that. It's not just de- it's not just depicted as her being the first disciple. He calls her the first disciple. So, yes, it's very women's lib. There, there's a lot of feminism that has been brought into this. Um, it, you just watch the characters whenever they're having conversations or whenever Jesus asks a question. The men are always idiots, and they say yes. the stupidest thing. Uh, of course, I mean the disciples did do did say stupid things. <laughs> we will we'll read the gospels and we'll see the the disciples react to something, and we might think to ourselves, "Oh, I wouldn't have said something that foolish." Uh, yeah, we we're just as as weak as they would have been. But um, uh, but anyway, when you watch it in the show, the men will say dumb stuff, and they'll have clueless looks on their faces, and they'll look at each other, and Jesus will roll his eyes at them or whatever. But it almost seems like a woman always has the right answer. There's a woman speaking up, and she's got it, and she nails it every time. And and so, yeah, there's definitely a, a very feminist leaning in the show uh, and giving Mary Magdalene um, uh, a, a, lot more, a lot more platform, a lot more room as a character than we even read of her in Scripture. Going to season four... There, the first clip of season four that I remember them putting out was where Jesus was con- confronting the scribes and the Pharisees like we have in Matthew 23. And as Jesus is on a roll, as he's going on a tear, just ripping into the Pharisees and how they don't care for people and they love their religion, but but not the people that they're supposed to be serving, the disciples, it, it cuts to the disciples and they're kind of like, uh, you know, deer in the headlights, like uh, this, this is bad. Jesus is confronting the Pharisees. They look a little panicky. It cuts to Mary and she's there with this confident look on her face. That's like, Oh, go get them. You know, and this, and and that's, that's exactly the kind of depiction you have in the show. The women have all the courage and the men are going, I don't know that this is right, that that we should be doing like this. So, uh, uh, yeah, the Mary Magdalene character is one that has, um, that, that receives a, a very high position I suppose. And not just not just in the sense that she's a disciple, but that she's the premier disciple. She was the first one. Do you have any thoughts on any of the other characters in the show? Like I know we had talked about on one of our previous episodes, the choice to make uh, Dallas Jenkins choice to make Matthew uh, to put him on the spectrum and make him have autism. And and, uh, then there's some other issues with some of the other characters. Did did you have anything you wanted to talk about about that? Well, so <laughs> that's really funny. I really don't care that Matthew is uh, is autistic in the show. It doesn't matter to me at all. I mean, if you want to make that with the character, it seems kind of typecasting though, or or kind of uh, like general generalizing, because they just did that with the character because he's he's good with numbers, and so it's you know he's a tax collector, and and Dallas has even said this in an interview. So it's like, well, he's good with numbers, and autistic people are good with numbers. So we're Kim autistic. I was like, wow, that's kind of, uh, I don't, I don't know what to think of that, but, um, but they're incredibly inconsistent with it. 
and uh, and like they'll make him this uh, this very um, uh, a neat freak, clean character, kind of OCD, and yet he and yet he owns a dog. But it's like mm-hmm. that's like the filthiest animal in Jerusalem. Why in the world would he own a dog? No Jew would own a dog. So. <laughs> You know, it's stuff like that 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 just like I don't really think you did your homework here. You just think you're being clever, and um, uh, but I think the biggest deal with Matthew, autism aside, I really don't care that they did that with the character. The problem that I have with the character is they made him an absolute fool when it comes to an understanding of of the scriptures, even on the most basic level. Jews had Jews knew their scriptures. They, it's why so many of them, including Matthew, thought of Jesus as being the Messiah, because they knew that the scriptures foretold this. They knew what the scriptures said about it. Matthew has an expert grasp on the Hebrew scriptures, and you see that when reading the gospel of Matthew. But they make the character of Matthew completely ignorant to the scriptures, and so that he has to be taught. And I think they could have gone about that a different way. There could have been another character somewhere that they made, you know, un, unlearned in the scriptures and tried to help that character along. And in that way, you know, as you see this done in a movie or a TV show where you have a character that's kind of clueless and the character represents the audience, we don't know what's going on. So, so they could have created another character to do that. I have no clue what got into their minds to think that that should have been Matthew. But, um, uh, but anyway, it's things like that that really bother me more than the liberties that they take with occupations and backgrounds and personalities with the disciples. I think there's some creative liberty that you can do some things with the disciples like that. Um, In fact, I think that at least the way that the show was pitched to me in the first place, it was first told to me about the chosen, that this is a story about Jesus' disciples, and it's kind of looking into their background and their stories a little bit more, not focusing so much on Christ, but but looking at the the whole... um, experience through the eyes of the disciples. And when I first heard that, I was like, well, that that sounds pretty cool. That could be intriguing because there's a lot we don't know about many of the disciples outside of their names. So I could see some creative liberties being taken there. And I think you could have made a show like that where, um, uh, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Lost, the J.J. Abrams show from, you know, over a decade ago. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, not to get too big into that, but the, um, you know, there were so many characters in that show that you might have a different episode that looks into the background of that character. And they could have done the same thing with the chosen. So a different episode is looking into the background of a particular disciple. And so then it doesn't become about Jesus and you don't have to worry about all of the, you know, potential second commandment violations or taking the, the Lord's name in vain. He's not even a main character in the show. He's almost like what Jesus was in Ben Hur. You see the back of his head occasionally, but he's not really somebody that is carrying the story. They could have told the story like that. It's actually kind of intriguing. I might actually be interested in watching something like that. But that's not the way that they went about doing this. Everything does center around Jesus in The Chosen. The most recognizable face in that show is Jonathan Rumi. And whenever you see uh, a, a poster or an image of The Chosen, it's not the disciples. It's it's Jonathan Rumi. And he's the one doing all the interviews and everything else. So... Uh, uh, it could have been, it, they could have taken a better pro- approach to the more creative approach to this. Um, you know, even even John MacArthur's book, Twelve Ordinary Men, uh, he has to do some speculation in some of that because we just don't know much about uh, some of those disciples' background. So it's okay to think about those kinds of things. What might this have been like? But uh, but not to the extent that the chosen takes it. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, why don't we get to some of those uh, questions about uh, relationships that people have, you know, women who hear about their friends or their family members who just love the chosen and how they should respond. Um, Let's go through some of these questions from our listeners. Um, Here's one that says, as women, how should we handle a pastor or friend who doesn't see the chosen as any different from any other Hollywood fictionalized account of Jesus? Or what what would we say uh, specifically? Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to the other answer of, of um, you know, if you've got a pastor or somebody like that that's using this as a teaching tool, then uh, there, there's yeah. that's worthy of a conversation. Why would we pull this in? I mean, pastors will take movie examples all the time. You know, uh, uh, I did one one time when I was kind of trying to help my congregation to understand the dynamic between Israel and the Philistines 
when he had the confrontation between David and Goliath. And there's a scene in uh, the movie um, Troy where um, uh, the character that Brad Pitt plays is going up against this giant like warrior. That's kind of somewhat like what it would have been like. You had your two lead champions that were going against one another and whatever champion won. You know, that's the side that's going to win. So I've used that illustration before, you know, in a movie, uh, something that came from a movie. Um, and, and maybe there are people that will do, uh, pastors will do things like that. But what makes The Chosen problematic is that you're actually drawing something that is an interpretation of Scripture into your teaching. And so that's troublesome. And that's why those things, we would, we would err more on the side of caution regarding that. Than if you were to, you know, mention Jurassic Park in a sermon or, <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, and I guess what uh, what the women are looking for who have uh, written to us have uh, they're they're looking for some practical advice on uh, what to what, what are the words they should say when uh, someone in a group starts talking about yeah. the chosen and maybe other people chime in and they start praising it too. Um, you know, you know, the the our listeners are pretty smart. I mean, they they're they're aware of all the problems with the show, but they don't know necessarily the best way to respond in each situation. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the question: by what standard? Like, like you're you're watching the chosen. You think it's profound. You are entertained by it. But what is your standard when you watch a show like this? Um, what what is what is your standard when it comes to thinking that what you are watching is an accurate or honest portrayal of Jesus? That it's okay for you to learn about Jesus through what is being depicted on this show? How do you justify that? What standard are you using? I think it's good in these kinds of conversations to let this bring it back to Scripture. How can you take the conversation and take it to the Bible so that you can show your friend who is potentially being misled by this what the Scripture actually says? Listen, I have friends that I would consider to be biblically solid that were telling me, have you seen The Chosen? It's actually a pretty good portrayal of Jesus. And then the very first clip I ever watched, I'm like, no, this is bad. (laughs) And but you know that's so even even people who are we would consider to be biblically sound can be uh, potentially led astray by this. And I think some of that comes from like a person who's biblically solid might be reading their solid theology into the gaps in a show like this. Mm-hmm. So you know, in the in the holes that the chosen leaves to fill, you know the Bible, and you might be putting it into those holes, and therefore thinking, wow, this is a pretty honest portrayal of Jesus. And so that's why, you know, when you have those conversations, even with somebody that's biblically solid, go back to what the scriptures say and then test it according to scripture to see that that these things actually line up with what God has said about it, not according to what um, uh, not according to what the, the show says. Uh, you know, as it says in Hebrews, let us bring before God acceptable worship. Well, acceptable worship is what God has said worship is supposed to look like. And so we need to be. Uh, honoring God and even portraying Christ according to what the scripture says. It's good. I think we can have these conversations regarding the show. That doesn't justify the presence of the show, but see if you can't bring those conversations back to an understanding of what scripture says. Yeah, that is a fantastic idea is use it, you know, use anything that your friend or your relative or whatever is saying to go back to scripture and to say, look, here's the real story that we should be looking at. And and what does scripture actually say in context about these things and what Jesus said and what Jesus taught and what he did? And I, I think what you're saying about, um, you know, people, even doctrinally sound people getting sucked in by this kind of thing. I think one of the issues there was that when it first started, I know I, I wrote a review of it uh, after the first season and I was trying to give it the benefit of the doubt and trying to extend grace, you know, because this is a fictional type of thing and it's not, you know, they're not doing Bible teaching per se, but, um, but I think the issue is that it has gotten progressively worse and worse and worse and worse. So if you got sucked in at the beginning when it wasn't 
quite as bad as it has gotten now, especially with all the other stuff that has gone on behind the scenes and has been revealed, you know, about the Mormon stuff and the homosexual stuff behind the scenes, which we haven't really talked about. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you know, that you if you get sucked in at the beginning, you kind of have that time invested and you don't want to let it go. And I think a lot of people don't realize how uh, watching it and believing it is affecting them. And that's what another listener asked us about. Uh, she said, how would you answer a friend who says, yeah, I know it's not consistent with the Bible, so I can watch it and it doesn't affect me. It's just entertainment. And so how do you answer someone like that? I'm thinking of also in with that question, I'm thinking also of, for example, the people who that we have heard say, you know, now when I pray, I picture Jonathan Rumi in my head or how the fact that when Jonathan Rumi goes out and has a speaking engagement, or he's just out in public or whatever, people approach him and talk to him like he's Jesus. So it is obviously affecting people. What do you say to a friend who says, it's not affecting me, it's just entertainment? Well, first of all, like Philippians 4, 8 tells us, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so we see these constant reminders in Scripture to fix our mind and our eyes on things that are honorable and pleasing to God. Uh, like in Romans 12, 2, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Colossians 3, saying, have your mind conformed to the image of your Creator. So there, there are constant reminders in Scripture of our meditation needs to be on Christ. And that's, that's something that we as Christians regularly need to think about. What am I regularly setting my thoughts on? And something I'm teaching my children right now, too, because my son will, will spend a lot more time in his day thinking about Mega Man than anything else. And so, <laughs> you know, trying to pull him away from the TV and teaching him, son, there, there are other things you need to be fixing your mind yes. on than being glued to this all day. And so, you know, setting parameters on those things so that in my own children's mind, they don't start to get their thoughts shaped by the stuff that they find the most interesting. So this goes back to something that we were saying before. I think a lot of times we just think too highly of ourselves and we, we don't think about our own weaknesses and tendencies to fall into these kinds of snares, these kinds of traps. Even when I was watching The Chosen, even when I was doing it for study, um, there were people that, you know, I was listening to the second commandment violation arguments that were being made and so on and so forth, but I'm not a very visually minded person anyway. And my wife will testify to this. Like she'll, <laughs> she'll say she's trying to decorate a room and she's trying to describe it to me. And I'm just going, I, I have no idea what you're saying. I can't see it at all. She has to do it. And then when I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, okay, that's what you were talking about. So it's, it's actually really easy for me. I'm, I'm a lot more auditory. Music will get stuck in my head. I can hear a song once and I never forget it. But, but visually, I'm not that way. And so I can watch The Chosen and then I can walk away from it and I'm not picturing those things in my head anymore. At least that's what I was saying in the beginning. But after time, when I watched two full seasons of it, and, and even some of those episodes I'm watching more than once because I'm writing notes down and making sure that I got my notes correct. I'm, I'm citing quotations correctly and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm watching all the behind the scenes stuff. So all the extra stuff, which is mountains and mountains of stuff, by the way, uh, the, the extra stuff that they put out on their YouTube channel and on their Facebook and everything is, is, is like hundreds of times more than the material that they put out on the program. It's, it's just, you can be inundated with the chosen stuff constantly. And so even after watching all of that, it really did start putting Jonathan Rumi in my head. And so it, it got to where when I am reading about Jesus, I'm picturing Jonathan Rumi. And even I don't want to do that. I hate that. The guy is, is a Catholic mystic. He is, is so far from Orthodox that it's not even funny. You know, he's pro LGBTQ and everything else. The man is not a believer. And, and even so in, anyway, even as I'm, uh, as I'm critiquing, even as I'm coming at this critically, I start to recognize the weaknesses in my own flesh and the own tendency of my own mind to start gravitating toward things that are not God honoring. 
And so, you know, in whatever way that you can use that to try to convince a friend, you really need to be careful with with this kind of thing because I think you you think too much of your own strengths and not enough of your own weaknesses. Yeah. And I think over the last couple of years too, and you mentioned you you touched on it. Both of you did a little bit ago about the uh, the gay pride colors, the LGBTQ connection uh, with uh, uh, the the folks who are on the crew, um, and it sure seems like Dallas uh, really wants to kind of stir the pot a little bit with that. Can you talk to that a little bit, Gabe? I think it was just a matter of time before all this stuff came out. I mean, you know, I had my suspicions, but you can't say anything until (laughs) there's actually evidence that comes forward that shows this. But the very fact that he was presenting something that was appealing to the world, you know, he's, he's following that typical pragmatic formula that we see in a lot of big evangelicalism in America, just trying to uh, appeal to the most number of people. And as long as we get them in, well, then they're getting a lot more wholesome stuff than they're getting out there in the world. Uh, but their their understanding of scripture is not built around reverence for God. It's it's built around trying to create a product that is the most appealing for the most number of people. So that's the worldly mind by which he approaches those things. And so, of course, when the LGBTQ stuff came up, eventually it was going to be revealed that Dallas is totally on the side of that. Um, and he might make statements like, no, I believe in the biblical definition of marriage, but uh, but he he makes defenses of the LGBTQ community, however, you know, much of a community you would consider that to be, he defends that and rips on Christians who are being quote unquote judgmental about it. And, uh, and so you can see where his loyalties lie. He would rather be defending his camera crew that in their, in their private lives and on their social media pages are, are posting stuff that is lewd and crude and completely indecent and would get a person fired from their job 20 years ago if people were doing that. But today, yeah, it's cool. This man's our brother and uh, and we're a family together on this film crew. You'll hear those people say that all the time. And so their loyalties to one another are more built around this show than it is actually grounded upon God's word and in, the, and, in his Holy Spirit. So uh, uh, yeah, like I said, it was uh, a lot of these things, when you're seeing that worldliness that's built into it, give it time. And eventually those things that are in secret will come to light, exactly as scripture says. Yeah. And, you know, those kinds of things, the the Mormon influence, the homosexuality stuff, the worldliness, all that stuff that's sort of going on behind the scenes can't help but affect the um, the direction of the show, I would say, because, you know, oh, yeah. for example, no Dallas has said that basically that he thinks Mormons are Christians and he's doubled down, tripled down, quadrupled yep. down on that a number of times. And and so, yeah, so it's really it's going to affect the content of the show as well. Even, you know, you're not going to have Jesus saying, yes, Mormons are Christians or anything like that, but it's, it is going to affect subtly the direction of the show. And I think another thing that's that is affecting the direction of the show, maybe the content of the show in ways that we probably can't even uh, see or or perceive is the financial aspect of it. The immense amount of money that Dallas Jenkins mm-hmm. and the leadership are making from the not just the show, but also the merch that is is associated with the show. There's there's a devotional. There's a, a quote unquote Bible study that goes along with the show. There's T-shirts and uh, I don't know. There's probably a Jesus bobblehead. I don't know, but uh, we we do have a listener who wants to know yeah. what the, what these people gain from um, from the chosen from this there this huge following and all of the money and they they want us to discuss the follow the money aspect of this to bring light to what this show is really all about so do you have any any additional thoughts on the merch and the money and the the huge following and all that well yeah i mean it's it's uh they're they're making their pockets fat <laughs> yeah. you know i think it is it is possible to be doctrinally sound and to make money off of that. It is possible to do that. But more often than not, when you're seeing something that is driven by the money, it is going to uh, it, it's going to compromise the doctrine significantly. So one of the most famous verses, one of the most out of context verses ever quoted is 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. 
And uh, often the way that gets quoted is money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what's being said there. It's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. And Paul goes on to say, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And really, when you look at the context of what Paul is talking about there, Timothy starts, this letter to Timothy begins with a warning against false teachers. Don't let anyone teach any different doctrine. You have another section right there in the center of the letter that comes that draws attention back to that. And then at the end of the letter in chapter six, he comes back to it again. When you're reading that verse in context in 610, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Another way to say that is false teaching or, or the love of money is the root of all kinds of false teaching. That's exactly what Paul is getting at. It's not saying that that a person loves sexual immorality because they love money. Um, it, it, it's saying that the love of money is going to affect what it is that a person teaches. And it's why Paul said in the requirements for an elder or an overseer of the church back in chapter three, that he must not be a lover of money. If he's a lover of money, then he is going to change or manipulate the message that he is saying for the sake of the dollar. He's going to make it palatable to the most number of people or even appeal to those rich people over there because they're the ones that are going to pay me for this. And that's what's happening with the chosen. And we can see that once the dollars continue to climb, once the big deals start getting made with Lionsgate and Hulu and everything else, it is going to affect the message. And Dallas has to keep the message a certain way or he's going to lose his deal with Disney. Um, it, Disney's not going to allow him to say certain things. You completely tie your hands, even on a creative aspect, uh, when you when you make those when you strike those kinds of deals. So I would hope that just in a general discernment sense that people can see that, can see those kinds of things going on, and recognize this is a huge money making venture, and that should be enough of a red flag for me to go. Um, uh, yeah, I I bet you the teaching's not real solid because. They're doing this for their dollar signs instead of to glorify Christ. Yes. And, you know, speaking of Disney or whatever happens with this next chapter, this this season four, whether it uh, appears, um, a lot of our listeners have not seen this in the theaters. You said it was only in the theaters and there were some film clips that were out of that. Did, uh, did you see that one, that particular season in the theater, Gabe? No, I didn't. I, I have never... I've never paid for this show. So <laughs> Me even though I've I've seen Amen. quite a bit of it, I've watched the free stuff that's been put out. I've not paid a dime to go see any of it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, and, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit, because I know you've seen some of the free clips that are uh, that are out there on, on season four. Is is there something in particular that's that's been concerning to you about that next season uh, that you've heard about or or have seen in some of the clips? No, I really haven't followed up with a lot of the stuff that's been going on in yeah. season four. Like I said, I, I think I've seen two clips of it. Um, I watched the one where where Mary gives the little smug look and everything. So, uh, uh, yeah. but yeah, most of most of what I know about it has been through the first three seasons. I only know about the political stuff, kind of behind the scenes, that's been going on uh, regarding season four. But uh, you know, earlier, so talking about the the homosexual aspect, the LGBTQ stuff that's made its way in there. They uh, there is a line in season three. I can't remember which episode it is, but it's when the women are talking with one another, Mary Magdalene being one of them, and uh, and one of the characters says, "Love is love," and uh, it, you know, take that is the mantra of the LGBTQ movement, and it it's yeah. a stupid line. You might as well be saying, "Water is water, air is air." It doesn't make <laughs> any doesn't doesn't even mean anything. Really, it's code for sodomy is love. That's really what they want you to. Uh, uh, to be conditioned to accept, but that, so you hear that kind of of verbiage that gets used in the LGBTQ movement that has made its way into the show. And again, that's even the love of money that has uh, affected and manipulated the uh, the dialogue in itself. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered just about everything that our listeners had asked us specifically about. So, Amy, do you have any anything else that you wanted to cover, real quick? No, I, I did have one commentary, though, because a lot of our listeners, like I said, had asked us about, you know, how do how do you tell your friends that this is just not right and that you shouldn't be uh, listening to The Chosen or watching The Chosen? And Gabe, maybe you could uh, give some guidelines here, because I, I always start with um, when I hear something like that. I'll say something like, um, you know, I, friend, I do have some concerns. Um, if you have a moment, I, I really would like to share them with you if you're open to it. And, you know, 
of course, the person wants to be open-minded and hear all sides, right? So uh, it's a it's a good way to just very gently open the door to then say, here are my concerns and have some bullet points ready and then share, like you said, Gabe, about scripture. You know, take them right there to the word. Yeah, scripture tells us all kinds of things with regards to how we should talk with one another. Yes. And uh, you, you think of like Colossians 4, where it says, that uh, your speech needs to always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Um, Ephesians 4, this is 29. Let no unwholesome word pro- uh, proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up what is needed, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. And in Colossians 3.16, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So it is good to have these kinds of conversations. Don't become a kind of a person that you see a friend that likes this and then like you cancel them in your head. Well, I can't be friends with them anymore. They're watching The Chosen. Now, this is a sanctifying moment where you have an opportunity to visit with a friend and encourage them in what scripture says and build each other up according to the word instead of letting your friend be led astray by stuff like this and potentially falling by the wayside. When we read in Romans 15:1 where it says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, but to please our neighbor for his good to build him up. So when we see things like this, we need to understand the responsibility that is upon each and every one of us to be our brother or sister's keeper. That is important for every Christian. Amen. That is true love. Loving the sheep well means having those conversations. So uh, that is so right, Gabe. Thank you so much for being with us today on A Word Fitly Spoken. Ladies, I am uh, privileged that you had asked me to be on here. Thank you so much, Gabe. And that's going to wrap things up for this edition of Glad You Asked on The Chosen with our special guest, Pastor Gabe Hughes. And as we close, we want to say a special thank you to Catherine, who went to our website, a word fitly spoken dot life, clicked on the support tab and made a kind donation to us via PayPal. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yes, and then thank thanks you. also to Becky and Melanie, our new patrons over at PayPal. Patreon. We are so grateful to you and to all our patrons for your monthly support. And we'd be so grateful if you donate to A Word Fitly Spoken via PayPal like Catherine or become a monthly donor over at Patreon like Becky and Melanie. All the information is at the support tab at awordfitlyspoken.life. And be sure to check out all our other resources while you're there. And until next time, Chuck the Chosen, read your Bible and walk worthy. Walk worthy.